Hi. The date of doing this video is the 29th of July 2011, a week after my country, Norway, experienced its first terror attack. It has had an impact on me as an all Norwegian, and although this is part of a talk on Norse mythology, I feel compelled to comment on what happened. I will relate to Norse mythology throughout though. Last Friday, the 22nd of July, just before 3.30, I was standing in my kitchen watching out of the window while thinking, for some reason I don't know, that the world was about to change and I felt the tension like I was thinking, is it going to be better or worse? I looked into the foliage because I live more or less in the forest and then we, my husband and I, heard a sound that we thought must be a particularly furious thunder. We looked at the sky and waited for the lightning to happen and more thunder but none came. We did not have a TV but we started the internet and um, was slightly distracted by other things there and then I received an SMS telling me to put on the news. So we did and watched and learned that the town that I was born in and which I visit very frequently had become a part of the world map of terror attacks in recent years. The thunder we had heard coincided exactly with the time of the bomb and other people in my local community said that they had heard explosions as well. Naturally, it was upsetting and terrible like all such bomb attacks and one wonders if someone has been killed, someone there, uh, one wonders at the extent of the damage, who's behind. Um, this being Norway, Scandinavia, well I don't know if many of you overseas can even conceive of the degree of stability and safety that our society has achieved in modern times. We have our share of incidents, but it is quite a small share compared to most other countries. So this, this was big and surreal. But it was still in within the sphere of what was expected. The first thing we thought was that, oh, now it's happening. It finally happened. It was just a matter of time. It was closer to home than usual, but it was something we had sort of expected in a way. Uh, and then the shooting began. It took several hours to form a picture of what was happening and what had happened, but now we know that a grown man wearing a police uniform, fully armed, went into a summer camp crammed with unarmed, unsuspecting, defenseless and entrapped civilians, most of whom were teenagers and children, and started shooting, hunting everyone while laughing and shouting threats and cries of uh, victory. As soon as we started to hear about it, uh, I thought that I don't think I have ever heard about modern Muslim terrorists who have actually sunk that low. So who would sink that low? The murderer calls himself a Christian conservative crusader and he identifies with the medieval crusaders and knight templars and the crusaders as all historians know never thought twice about massacring defenseless people whom the crusaders believed possessed the wrong views including pagans and heretics the crusaders were the kind of people who would say put out the eyes of every man woman and child in a village and then parade the victims before the next village and ask will you convert now so I'm not surprised that this pity tyrant looks up to the crusaders as his idols. The murderer also believes that we should return to the medieval ways with its inquisitions and endless slaughter of people who do not confirm to the religious and political views of their leaders. It was not a religious attack, however, but a political one. The victims of the attack were mostly people attached to the largest working class part funded party in Norway, the Social Democratic Labour Party. And um, I don't think I actually voted Labour, but I recognised a massive role of this party in the creation of that stable and peaceful welfare society that too many Norwegians today take for granted. They, Labour, became the number one target because they are powerful, as they should be, uh, since they have a lot of democratic votes behind them and because they usually focus on welfare and equality for all who live in Norway no matter their origin. The murderer is clearly connected to right-wing extremist ideology that is very much akin to fascism and Nazism but adapted to modern times and as far as I'm concerned these movements belong to the same kind of category as all the other religious and political ideologies of all kinds which profess that a few people have the right to decide not only how everyone should live but even how everyone should think and believe and feel and speak and those who will not obey 
or be silenced should be slaughtered with children and all. In short, they all suck. Pardon me for being so rude. That said, a good thing actually came out of the slaughter, because after a few days the spell of shock, of horror, of hollow grief seemed to be lifted as the people of Norway, whether they were born here or came here, took a stand against such hateful ideologies in a most profound and beautiful way. Hundreds of thousands of people crowded the streets in cities and towns all over the country, carrying roses, and when they couldn't find roses they carried other flowers, covering the streets the statues, the monuments, the fences surrounding the bombed area, the containers filled with rubble from the bombed area. It was all cowed, covered, covered with flowers and candles. I was there and I have never seen anything like it. Never seen such a massive display of solidarity. It was the first time the concept flower power became something more to me than just a naive and abstract notion of the hippie era. This was real flower power and this was solid power. So many people crowded together in total silence, lifting their roses into the air, making shrines everywhere. I spent seven hours in the city, surrounded by thousands and thousands and thousands of thousands of people. There were people everywhere. I never, and I've been around the world, I've never seen so many people in one place. And yet, there was space. I could move. Everybody, absolutely everybody, treated each other with care and respect. There were no shouts for vengeance, no shouts of anger, not even sentimentality or self-pity, just a silent, spontaneous, enormous gathering of people holding their heads high. I've never seen the like, in this life anyway. I often walk through the city and watch people as I pass and I've often been a bit saddened because most people seem to never be present in the world. They often seem to have this defeated look about them, fearful, tired, there's a lot of unhappiness. And I rarely see anybody at all with, you know, the real spark in their eyes. But that day, everybody was present in the moment. Wherever I turned, I saw the same look in people's faces. Everybody had that spark in their eyes. Despite all the calm and control and respect that was shown, despite the enormous silence, I recognized something I would call the warrior spirit live and awake in the eyes of men and women. It is not a warrior spirit seeking to go to battle. It is not one going for revenge. It was a warrior spirit that make people stand up for themselves and for each other. Because in all this peaceful calm, these people demonstrated that they refused to submit to fear, refused to submit to hatred, and who despite all other differences agreed that everybody in a civilized society has a right to express what they think and to be heard and to be respected as human beings as long as they promote their cases in respect for life and human rights. Um, I'm not used to addressing these kinds of subjects because this is not a political YouTube blog and I prefer to stay out of politics and I'm not going to discuss politics with any of you. I'm blessed or cursed with an ability to nearly always see and understand the other side of an argument which makes it very difficult sometimes to make a firm stand in many cases. Um, I serve better as a sort of unattached diplomat but that does not mean I do not have values or opinions. As a therapist, I know that human beings have a natural need to express who they are and to share their particular gifts with the world and to be accepted and respected as they are and to have emotional support uh, from others who understand us. We are born with these needs. It is our natural birthright, our heritage, and we get tense, unhappy, nervous and eventually sick if these needs are suppressed or met and not met, which is often the case for many people. I think that the lack of, lack of spark, the lack of warrior spirit in the general modern society derives from such problems. And I think that the birth of that spark in so many people that day was a result of people supporting each other and respecting each other and that they had become aware that this is something precious. If the human species, or I should say the human race, is ever going to reach its full potential, or f our full spiritual, mental and physical potential as fun-loving, curious, creative, um, exploring beings of infinite variety, we, all of us, in all our diversity, 
need absolute freedom to be who we are without fear. If we, we are ever going to get there, we must cultivate our respect for the fact that there are many of us and that we are individuals and that we experience the world in different ways. And we must continue what we as a species have only just started in recent times to realize that a society can and must be ruled through negotiations and compromises between all these different interests, values and opinions. Where everybody have a right to be heard and seen without fear of violence. That is called democracy and in many ways it's still in its infancy. Uh, it's still very challenged by other kinds of influences and it's full of defects and it's up to us to strengthen it and perfect it but it has to continue to pay the way for us if some people are to set themselves up as despots once again trying to force us into being like single-minded little working ants blindly giving all for the anthill we will remain a suffering race and the full potential of human evolution will never take place now how will any of this relate to norse mythology <coughs> a lot I've already almost exhausted the subject of the death of Baldr and the peace of wisdom, but I cannot stress how important this is. Like us, Viking Age people lived in an unstable and often violent age. Like us, they had a sort of democracy. Originally, Germanic and Scandinavian people ruled society by the decrees of the Ting, a sort of parliament. At Parliament, technically, every free man and woman could speak their cases, but the common thing was that men and women took their cases to the head of the household, who took the case further to the head of the clan, who then eventually brought the cases of all his clan members up at Parliament. Parliaments were held every year and surrounded with um, not only markets and festivities, but also with religious ceremonies and rituals. The Parliament was sacred, sacrosanct, copy on earth of the parliament by which even the gods ruled in the upper heavens. As it is said in the prose and the poetic Edda, the gods met regularly to hold parliament by the well of origin in the realm of the Norns, the goddesses of fate. In the poem Völuspå, the divine parliament is mentioned several times. Stanza 6, 9, 23 and 25 begin with the following words. Vågen gör egen öl och rök stola. Gin heile god och om dat gettusk. And that means, then all the powers went to the chairs of fate, the high holy gods, to discuss this matter. The parliament stanzas of the poem, where the gods discuss the problems that arise during the continuous creation of the world, end when Ragnarok, Ragnarok begins and the world suffers. But parliament begin again after the Ragnarok in the new world, when the surviving gods meet at Ida Völler. This place is made up of the word Id and the word Völler. Völler means a field or a plain, and Ida is the uh, plural genitive form of the word Id, which means a stream that separates from the mainstream and returns to the water source. It is the same word that makes up the name of the goddess Eden. Um, in the new world, the parliament in which all the different gods may speak their minds and where fate is created is restored. In the poem Hov Amol, the parliament is mentioned several times as a place where wisdom and eloquence will help a person to promote his case and make friends of his enemies. It is also a place where the god Odin, who always seeks wisdom, is present as an observer and a learner, as he himself says in stanza 111. Mål är att sälja thular stål i a, urdar brunni att, så ek och thagdak, så ek och hyktak. Lidda ek a manna mål, och frunar höjda ek domma, nå em rådom thagdo. Translation, it is time to speak from the seat of the reciting sage, that would be Odin's seat at parliament, by the well of origin, that is the well of the Norns where the parliament was held. I'll just begin again. It is time to speak from the seat of the reciting sage. By the well of origin, I saw and was silent. I saw and considered. I heard the languages of people. I had talk of the runes. And good counsel was not withheld from us. In the Trimskvida, we hear again of Parliament. Thor's hammer has been stolen and stanza 14 goes, Sen varu esir allera thingi, och åsynjor. And that translates, then all the gods went to the parliament and all the goddesses, all to have their say. And about this the powerful rulers discussed, 
and then blah 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 they discuss the same thing happens in the Vegtamskvida. stanza one contains the exact same words uh, stanza one of the Vegtamskvida contains exactly the same words as the stanza 14 in the Trimskvida, as if the lines made up a formula which they probably do, and I shall repeat it. Then all the gods went to parliament, and all the goddesses, all to have their say, and about this the powerful rulers discussed, and so forth. I earlier mentioned the fact that the, in the Völuspo poem the divine parliaments were held before and after Ragnarok, but not during it, when brothers killed each other and murderers prevailed. The parliament in the Vegtamskvida and in the Trimskvida, where all the gods and goddesses partook in the realm of fate, were also held before the death of Baldur. They were in fact held during the golden era known as Froda Frider, which directly translates as Wisdom's Peace. This was when Baldur, whose name means grand or courageous, lived in his realm Breida Blick, which directly translates as broad vision. This is a myth of a time when people's mind and perceptions were broad, wide, open, a place from where everything could be seen and understood clearly. Baldur, or what Baldur represents in humankind, was killed or destroyed uh, by an otherwise unknown character called Höder Blindi. Höder in Old Norse literally means strife, struggle, paraphrasing it, aggression. Blindi means blind, a meaning that speaks for itself, but which also means ignorance. When translating these names, it becomes clear that this is a parable about how a courageous, open and broad mind was destroyed by ignorant aggression. It is also a parable about how an entire society's courage, openness and broadness of mind were destroyed by ignorant aggression. And this is what leads to Ragnarok, which we in many ways have been experiencing uh, already for a very long time. I know that many of you who watch my videos feel a longing for the wisdom of the ancestors and that some of you try to practice some of their religion. So I say, if you take these myths seriously, if you want to let these ancestral wisdom teachers who created these myths help guide your path, then you should always strive to open and broaden your mind and not let yourself be blinded by aggressive feelings, fear or anger. That would be to practice an ancient ancestral path to long for the return of courageous broadness of mind with all your heart and all your beings and let go of jealousy, fear and anger. Another matching myth or parallel myth is the myth of how Kvasir was killed. Kvasir was the creation of the united powers who, at parliament, all spit their essence into the same cauldron. Kvasir, who embodied the essence of all the gods, then moved freely through the world so that anyone could reach him and find answers to any question for Kvasir was infinite divine wisdom in which every power had been expressed and every sort of experience had been stored. Why was Kvasir killed? Why Kvasir was killed because a couple of people decided that they didn't want anyone but themselves to have answers. It is right there in Snorri's tale that dwarves who kill infinite wisdom try to keep it in cauldrons that they hid away from the world. They said that they didn't think anyone but themselves were clever enough to ask good questions anyway. They tried to monopolize answers. No one else were to have answers or wisdom. Sounds familiar? The dwarves, like most despots, were not in reality very wise and died in the process, but the cauldron remained hidden in the underworld because of what they did, and could only be reached by the fearless initiate and seeker of wisdom and ever-growing understanding. Um, a third parallel story is found in the poem Grottesanger, where two giantesses are described as drawing the mill of fate. During the peace of wisdom, where wisdom was the ruling force, the ladies of fate grant happiness and prosperity. But wisdom becomes greedy and starts to cruelly abuse his subjects and then he falls asleep. And while wisdom sleeps, the ladies of fate grind his era into destruction, famine and war, the Ragnarok. Sounds familiar too, doesn't it? Our world is indeed ruled by King Greed, who will stop at nothing to exploit and suck the blood out of fellow human beings in order to become even more insanely rich than uh, King Greed already is. The message of the Edda is clear. 
do not become overcome by greed for riches. Do not let your thirst for prosperity come in the way of your integrity and wisdom. And do not exploit others. All these myths tell in different ways why Ragnarok started to happen and why it is happening. People today are very much concerned with the end of the world, that the big catastrophe is yet to happen. Um, this is a thought that is heavily influenced by the book of Revelations in the Bible, which describes the doomsday. And certain kinds of people have always been eagerly expecting doomsday since the church was settled, where all the people they don't approve of are going to hell, and they themselves will go to heaven and pick their noses at the rest of us. Uh, this basic line of thought I think I can recognize it in almost all doomsday prophecies that are being now distributed online. Um, in the Edda, Ragnarok could be interpreted, and I do, as an era, just like the Golden Age was an era. The Ragnarok is an era of war, violence, outbreakers, slavery, chaos, suffering and natural catastrophes. The Ragnarok is when the gods prepare to battle with the wolf of greed, to battle with the serpent that encircles and limits the human world, and to battle with poisonous acid. Um, as I see it, Ragnarok is happening, and it has been happening for quite a while. And whether it will culminate in some great thing in 2012 or any other date, uh, or just reach its end eventually, is not for me to say. But the reality described in the Edda is not so much of a doomsday as it is an era of suffering for everyone. And we are, as a whole, as a species, living it already. And it began with blind aggression, prevailing over broadness of mind, and it began with greed and, res and the resulting exploitation of people, and it began with the monopolizing of answers by a few jealous people. But what is very clear in the Edda is that there are forces that will conquer the greed, that will conquer the acidly poisonous hatred and, and that will conquer the limitation of mind, the blindness, and that these forces will be present. present as surviving forces who will make a better world, who will recover the wisdom of the ancestors and experience the rebirth of the sun and the earth. Among the surviving gods is Baldr, returning from Hel with his broad mind and his wide perception, in his union of wholeness with his wife of the red ring of divine wisdom. Another is Hödr, the struggle, who was his killer, but who returns now, reunited with his brother and no longer blind. Another is Forseti, uh, his name means front seat, and he's the embodiment of fairness and justice, and justice will have the front seat, as his name indicates. And yet another is Vidar the Silent, who defeated the wolf of greed and fear. His name means the expander, that silent expander of the fearless mind. Only that kind of expansion can overcome the wolf of greed and fear, and that silent expansion was happening during the Rose March in Norway this week. After Ragnarok, these powers shall all meet in Parliament and together retrieve the lost tablets of wisdom that is our heritage. This guy uh, who killed children, this murderer, claims to be a warrior, a hero who protects the Western world against all the monsters out there and in here. Uh, he has even brought him, bought himself uniforms and medals with which he proudly poses in countless kind of photographs. This made me think um, this made me think of another medal. It belonged to my grandfather. Um, he was actually the one who introduced me, my grandfather, to the, to the literature of the Norse people. He could recite whole poems and quote many juicy sayings from the sagas and he gave me he gave me um, a book of sagas uh, when I was 14 and when he was old and I was a young woman I was helping him uh, to clean out his shelves and cases and then I found uh, hidden some papers and a medal the papers were a few illegal newspapers from 1942 and then a diploma from 1945 commending my grandfather for his military service in the secret resistance movement against the Nazi occupation of Norway and uh, a medal meaning the same thing. So I found it there in the case and I said, Grandpa, why do you keep this medal hidden away like this? It sort of proves that you're a war hero or something. And he said, well, I keep it hidden because it reminds me of things I cannot bear to think about. 
We did what we had to do. And I would have done it again. We were occupied. I could not just... Occup we were invaded. I could not just sit by and watch as these creeps took over our country and introduce their sick rules. We hated them. We hated the world they were trying to impose on us and the way they treated us like second-class citizens in our own country and the way they march around and scream at people all the time and try to rule us. But when you came close to, you could see that for all their bravado and shouting and rudeness, they were just frightened boys. And it is a horrible thing, Maria, he said to me, to sit at the end of my life and know that one of the few areas in which I possess actual expertise is in how to most effectively and silently take the life of another human being with my bare hands. And uh, that silenced me anyway. I said no more. He was a wise man, my grandfather, and, uh, and very gentle, very respectful of all life. And when he had to be, he was a warrior but he never flaunted his medal or bragged about his deeds and he never killed anyone or anything for fun like that laughing psychopath who thinks he's a hero. I have met at least one real hero. She was an old woman who was a young woman during the war. She spent the first three years of the war risking her life helping innocent people to escape the persecution of the Nazis by guiding them through the forests of Norway into neutral Sweden where they could be safe. She saved hundreds of people, and then she was caught. She spent the last two years of the war in the Ravensbrück concentration camp for women. She was not sent to the gas chamber because, well, she was not a Jew, she was strong, she looked Scandinavian, but she had to clean up after gas chamber massacres. She had only one thing to say about that that I remember. If you're ever going to go into a gas chamber carrying a small child, do not try to protect the child with your body. Hold the child out in front of you so that it can die quickly. She spent the rest of her life traveling around and telling people about what she had experienced. She's the most courageous person I've ever met. She, having never even been in combat, was a warrior, a real one. Now, this um, killer who hunted and shut down our children last Friday thinks that he is protecting Western cultures and Western greatness and values or something. But what he wants is a despotic regime and a taught police and an endless violent crusade against everyone who disagrees with him, like in the good old times, otherwise known as the Dark Ages. So I ask, what is Western about that? What is original about that? Every advanced society all over the world, in all parts of the world, has tried that. And lots of cultures began such despotic regimes and thought polices thousands of years before it happened in Europe. It has been happening, happening everywhere, all over the world. Great civilizations had introduced dogmas for how and what people should think and say, and then forced everybody into submission through massive and ongoing violence. Throughout history, all over the world, despots have ruled and crusaded and conquered and exploited other people. There is nothing particular about it. There is nothing unique or original about it for anyone. Single-mindedness and blind submission in fear of persecution is not a particular Western value. All cultural regions have, in my opinion, cultivated some precious gifts to humanity, something that is unique and special, and crusades of any kind are not special to anybody, they're universal, they're old news. If there's anything that the Western world has birthed and nourished that is unique and special and should be seen as a gift, it is the idea of democracy. As far as I know, that idea began here. I'm not obviously talking about tribal councils in tribal communities now. They have been happening in many parts of the world. I'm talking about you know, civilizations where there are lots of different interests and opinions and values. Um, so whereas the historical rule all over the world was that a few people monopolized all power and property, something akin to democracy popped up in Europe from an early age. It happened in the early Greek and Roman societies and it happened in Northern Europe. And this age-old parliament survived in Scandinavia until the time of the conversion a thousand years ago. I'm not saying that these early democracies were perfect, just like today they were faced with the uh, challenge of people who sought to dominate the debate through corruption and violence and not everybody had the vote. 
but the idea was birthed and tried out and it is one of those few phenomena that actually makes Europe special. Democracy has been destroyed several times in several places, but it has dug its roots, the idea that ruling should happen through compromise and debate between different people. And from that idea was birthed all kinds of civil rights and human rights and equality movements that have painstakingly struggled for their place in a democracy for the last three, four, 500 years. As far as I know, these movements of equality and individual freedom were born in Europe and are distinctly Western values and they are something that we can actually be proud of. If there is anything worth protect protecting, worth nourishing, worth fighting for and worth dying for about Western culture, it must be the idea of democracy where everybody has an opportunity to stand up for their cause and a right to be heard. The murderer was angry because he felt that his enemies had taken over his world. But that is because he's a coward. Courage, that is to accept the vote of the majority. Accept that the vote of the majority will sometimes mean that you're not getting your way. Rather than raging and feel victimized against the fact that your view just wasn't the most popular view, you should be happy that you still, even so, have the right to argue your views without bombs and guns and threats. Rule by parliament and voting was sacred to the Norse pagans more than a thousand years ago. It has still only taken its first few uncertain steps faced with massive challenges from those in whose interest it is to keep people in the dark. I dedicate this video to the two teenagers from my local community who were shot to death by a laughing coward. and to all the others who died, and to everyone who's ever died, because they exercised their right to have an opinion and to be heard. Thank you.